This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of the world-famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Comedy, formerly Raw Dog, also available as a podcast and on YouTube. This is Dan Natterman. Uh, I am a regular comedian here at the Comedy Cellar. I'm here with Noam Dorman, the owner, the proprietor of the world-famous, ever-expanding Comedy Cellar. Some have called it the Mecca of Comedy. Who called it that? Well, uh, Eric Newman calls it that. Does he really? When he's on stage, he says, you're oh. at the Mecca of Comedy. Okay. Uh, we also have Perry Alashin brand with us. It's controversial these days, right? Yes. And the also, there the, were no, to be the mecca of anything. Uh, there was, there were little, no, there were no more, Muslims on the show. A little more political than we want to get. Perry Alashin brand is here. She's our producer, and she's our booker, and she's an on-air personality, and she is Noam's foil of sorts, bringing a more liberal uh, point of view. Did not Noam, anymore. Noam she, more, she, she barely brings. What do you mean, not anymore? <laughs> not, oh, not, not, not Israel's <laughs> attack. She she barely brings it in. Um. Anyway, um. Our our we have Jonathan Haidt, who's a, an eminent height height, an eminent uh, psychology professor, who will be joining us in a few minutes. But before that, uh, we can discuss. Well, I I opened for Howie Mandel uh, last weekend. If we want to discuss that. Or? Sure. What happened? Where is he on Israel? Uh, he didn't mention it. Uh, also, because our drivers, we, we our drivers, I suspect, were of uh, Arab uh, derivation, and uh, so that that might have been what what prevented anybody from talking. You know, in the car on the way on the way to the gigs. Um, I mean, no, that's, least, that's 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 sensitive of you. I would I would have taken the same approach. Um, Can't you ask to put up the? <laughs> no, was it like uh, on Spinal Tap where, you know, we remember? You don't remember? Did you see Spinal Tap where the uh, but, yeah, where the where, in, the, in, where like the, the chauffeur is yeah. talking to them? The chauffeur is talking to them, and they just—they're just going, oh, "Okay, uh huh," and they're rolling up the window as they're doing it, rolling uh, up the divider as yeah. the, as the chauffeur is trying to engage them in conversation. Yeah, so you should have done. Yeah, well, we didn't have that. It was like an escalator. They didn't have that. Okay. Uh, I don't think people do limousines anymore. Usually, it's like no, but but they have it. They, I think I think they do put dividers in SUVs. Well, I, we didn't have it. In any case, um, that happened to me. I was in a car with Judy Gold, and I told her not to talk about politics or anti-Semitism because our driver. Let me just tell the listeners to hang in there. We are going to have John Hyde. <laughs> well, <laughs> and of course, she started <laughs> screaming about anti-Semitism. Um, yes, I can say that. I think it was the name of her book, and Correct. she's living out that, uh, mm-hmm. living that out in real life. Uh, well, the only thing I'll say about opening for Howie Mandel is, you know, I, I I used to say to myself, you know, being an opener, that's the greatest gig ever because it's so easy and there's no pressure. But I find I get really anxious because, well, first of all, I'm always anxious, but <laughs> I'm even more than normal because it's like they're there for him, and so I feel like they're gonna just not, they're gonna resent me as soon as I get on stage because, like, you know, they the announcer says, "Are you ready for an evening with Howie Mandel?" Woo! But first, and then I go on, and they're nice, and they, they they don't seem to be at all upset by the fact that I'm taking up 25 minutes of their time, but I always feel that they will, and uh, so I, I get anxious, because I don't need... But I've asked you this so many times, after you do it, and you see time and time again that it's not true, and they're happy to see you, and they love you, and they think you're so funny. Well, time and time again, I don't have cancer, but every time I go to the doctor... I- <laughs> I think this is it. No, that's right. Nobody wants to see the opener. That's not true. I think in comedy, it's... Of course it's true. I, I think in comedy, it's a lot less true than it is in music. Because in comedy, in music typically, at least the shows I've seen, the opener is like, you, you know... First They're of all, funny. It's the funny. The are funny that open for big-name comics. Um... I'm or, I'm or, and, and and hopefully the the big name comic chooses somebody that they think their audience will that's like. That's right. That's right. I, I think my problem is that, and I I guess I'm not that representative. No. Nope. There's never a show. Almost never a show that I go to that isn't longer than I want it to be. That's every time you leave the house. So like any time I go to a Broadway show, no matter how great it is. I'd be very happy if the intermission had been the end. And um, except for a few amazing concerts I've seen over the years that I really hung on till the end. So if I'm going to see a headlining comedian, I know they're going to do about an hour. Yeah, they do about an hour. But an hour is not that much time compared to a Broadway show, which is going to be two and a half hours. Right, but an hour is as much time as I really want to be there to have... you know, so you're not I'm adding up the openers like those two openers. I'm like, oh fuck, I'm gonna be here for two hours. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how funny you you're are. You're not representative. I don't though, think you're no, represent. Um, Let's ask Max, who's a younger guy and a comedy fan. I guess. Well, he's oh. also a comic. Oh, you, Max, you do comedy? Yeah. Max is our sound person. 
Um, engineer. Sound engineer, whatever you want to call him. Uh, <laughs> she's correct. She, she's, she finds a politically correct woke <laughs> problem with everything. <laughs> Apparently, you don't call them sound people anymore. They're, they're sound engineers. Well, I mean, oh, sorry. you know. <laughs> Send <Please>. your letters to... <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> sound dude. Yeah. What uh, What is your take on what Noam is saying? Do you Are you a consumer of comedy? You do comedy, but do you consume it? Yeah, I like comedy. I I would like the opener. I like the whole show on that. But I agree with Noam with uh, probably any other any other like a musical or anything else. I would want things to be shorter, like a movie. But yeah, stand up's the one thing where I would like. Well, because again, like, he was only doing an hour. Now Louis, I opened for him, and he did longer. Uh, so. You know, he might have done an hour. 15. When I went to Chicago and you and Vecchione opened for Louie, right? Yeah. And it was great. Everybody loved it. You guys are not representative. We live in this world. We see comedy all the time. People are coming out. They usually, you it has know. nothing to do with that. No, it has everything to do no, with that. No, I just, I said it's any kind of show. Everything for is, you, though, because you yes, live outside. You live in the entertainment industry. You watch the best comedians every night. It's not of just course. comedy. It's it's movies. It's Broadway shows. It's it, Noam has a short attention span. It, it's Not if he's on stage playing music. He doesn't, right? Things are longer than they need to be. You don't like to leave the house. Anyway, I do think there's, a, in addition to what you're saying, and I don't think you're representative of most people, because I think an hour... I think most people, look, the people that come here to the cellar, it's an hour and a half show. Correct? Yeah, you know, I per, in, a so, night, in a nightclub, it's not as bad for me because you have somebody waiting on, you get something to eat. You're, it's, but, the, like, the whole ordeal of going to, like, Madison Square Garden and the, the, the getting there and the tickets and going through the metal, the t- it, it's such a fucking ordeal. I can't, I'm already wanting to come home by the time I sit down. Well, you're obviously an extreme case of, uh, of homebodiness. It's not, it's not to be home. You guys are putting thoughts. It's not to be home. So where do you want to be? Home. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, no, I'm happy to be at the olive tree. I'm happy to be at friend's house. I'm happy to be at dinner. I don't mind going to dinner. I, I just, I don't want to see an opener. That's all. All right. But but I okay, think. Can we talk about Israel now? <laughs> um, yes, let's. Well, do you have anything new to discuss? Um, well, yeah. Except, by the, except that you, you, know, you said to me, maybe it was a week ago, maybe it was two weeks ago, you're now on Twitter somewhat active on Twitter and you said to me it's a bad habit I'm not going to do it anymore and you're still doing it yeah it's making me sick and um and people are coming at you obviously very hard on Twitter because that's what people do on Twitter not too hard not too hard and I think somebody I, called, called you I mean they're, they're pretty harsh but. but what I have noticed and this is not the first time I've noticed this because I've dealt with this with uh when I got a lot of hate mail when Louis was uh, uh you know uh, uh the hot issue people will come at you very hard and then if you don't react in kind, if you say something, you know, reasonable, ha- yeah, reasonable measured. And, and, and measured and maybe, maybe a little joke, slightly joking, but just if they get it, you, you can see it on Twitter. The next day they say, I'm sorry, I, you know, you're right. I shouldn't have come at you like that way. You know, like they, they, they will back down and then they'll, um, and then they'll, you know, well, they there's a the human being on the other side. Yeah, yeah, because it, now it's it's easier for me to do that because I actually don't stake out. I'm not, I'm not posting outrageous material on Twitter. I'm not posting these memes about how you know. How, don't look at me. When how, you say how, that. How awful, uh, you know, the Palestinians are, or 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 displaying a. I, I don't. I hope I'm not displaying like a lack of care. Like there are there are, there are people who are so harsh that I don't think there's any way back from that. But I think. If, if they when, when I cause them to actually say, wait a second, did you hear what I said? Did you listen to what I said? They, they realize oh, I don't really have that much on him. Like I know he disagrees with me, but he didn't say anything terrible for the most part. So, but the the Twitter thing is is getting to me. And um, like just before we started, there's this new thing there with the gray zone. Aaron Mate, who we had on, is a member of the gray zone. And there, I don't know if this speaks for Aaron yet, but I I fear that it does. They are all in on this notion that Israel killed these people. I that it was friendly fire yeah, and, on October and they, 7th. And they speak in a fuzzy way. Do they mean two people? And, you know, of course, friendly fire is always a possibility. Would it shock me if some people were killed in friendly fire when the soldiers came in to try to uh, protect the kibbutz? Well, of course, 
you know, this happens all the time. Um, traditionally under the law, the people are still guilty of the murder, even if, if even if they're killed with friendly fire, because they 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 brought that situation to bear. But there really is no evidence of um, there's no proof of any of any friendly fire casualties. It does seem like maybe one or two people may have died from friendly fire, and that's no that's nothing for Israel to be ashamed of. It's not like uh, that doesn't let Hamas off the hook in any way. But, you know, as I've said for many years already, but it's just getting worse, the the big the thing that really is worries me about our current climate hasn't been free speech. It ha- it's it's the it's the the uh, cancer of conspiracy theories. Yes, they're everywhere and they are not sufficiently stigmatized such that some of the most important figures um, allow them to be spun out without really challenging them. Now, I've had people on here who I think have, you know, um, uh, played with conspiracy theories. But then I I have my homework. I'm, I'm ready to challenge them. I want to expose that they're conspiracy theories. But a lot of shows now I see on... Uh, or here on uh, podcasts, they just let these guys come out there and blah, 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 and they're not challenged, and they spread into the bloodstream, and nobody knows what to believe anymore. Tucker Carlson is saying that, uh, you know, we have we have dead aliens and we're studying their weapon <laughs> systems in the American <laughs> government. He's, he's really saying this, and that, that uh, you have, uh, aliens from other planets are killing cattle and we need to, uh, men should be, tanning their balls for more testosterone. Are you serious? That's the one that got you. That's the only one which is sort of... <laughs> that's, the, that's the one which is sort of plausible. No, we have... We, we're, one degree of separ- we're one degree of separation from, uh, from Tucker via our friend uh, Michael. Who? Michael Moynihan. Oh, yeah, we should be able to get Tucker. We should try to get... I don't want... But, um, and then uh, JFK Jr. says that COVID was engineered to avoid... Ashkenazi Jews, and then of course there's all the there's all the quasi true stuff. Like, yes, it's true. There, the vaccines weren't as effective as we were told. Yes, mask mandates aren't as effective as we were told. Yes, the lockdowns probably might have been a bad idea. At least it, or, or at least definitely went on too long. There's all there's all sorts of these facts, and you know I was always open to these facts that I just mentioned now all during COVID. I was always someone who was like, well, let's consider it. Mm-hmm. But it goes to like, masks don't work. The vaccine doesn't work, a lot, which is, you know, which seems to me to be crazy talk. And we see it now with Israel as well. And what, what don't we, what don't we see it with? Every, well, Ukraine has all these conspiracies. There's, there's bioweapons labs in Ukraine apparently. And, uh, um, Nazis and it's just you know Michael Shermer might be a good guest. He wrote a book about why people believe weird things. Oh yeah, I'd love to have him. Where on. he explored, uh, you know, what you're discussing, what, what why conspiracy theories exist and why people feel the need to believe conspiracy theories. And then Brett Weinstein and and he said that 9/11 w- was uh, an inside job, or he he clearly alludes to it without. Um, no, but some people are. And maybe Tucker's in this category. Maybe Brett Weinstein is as well. Some people just they know a a, a a good hook when they see one, and they know that conspiracy theories are a nice way to get a lot of followers, maybe sell a lot of books. And so you know, one wonders whether Tucker really believes what he's saying. Well, I mean, I I, I said this before that used to be you'd get the news, the Times, Time Magazine, Newsweek, whatever it is, and then as you're checking out of the supermarket, there'd be the National Enquirer and and and, and tablets like that. And from time to time, the National Enquirer would have some Something break real. some actual news. Yeah, yeah. But you knew that if it was the National Enquirer, you know, it was probably, you know, you, you, you took it with a huge grain of salt because. Well, except for the people that were regular readers of the National Enquirer, unless they were just reading it for because they thought it was good fiction. Yeah. But now the stories that used to be in the National Enquirer have jumped the shark into the new media, which has no. Um, there's no categories. Like you don't know people. Brett Weinstein is a famous uh, bio uh, bioevolutionist, whatever you evolutionary biologist, and he was the guy 
at um, what's the name of the university? Uh, what's the name of the university? I at don't Weinstein? remember. Um, I don't have no idea. Oh, that's my my uh, uh, senior moment. But um, he was he was the the guy who who got on the other end of that that sit in at the university where he wouldn't. Was it Austin? No, where he wouldn't play along with the. Uh, where they want to have no white people in the school one day or whatever it is. So he was um, he was a good guy, and he was a he was um, kind of evergreen, he, evergreen, state yeah, evergreen. And he was kind of a good hero for people like me. But he's also the guy now spouting out all this nonsense, and uh, I think it's damaging the country. By the way. Um it is damaging the country. I think that this is also what you're seeing on Twitter. Yeah, you but you believe it too. You're the one no, 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 no. that Kentucky Fried Chicken is not real chicken. Okay, and, and you and, and you anything you see on a meme, you believe. It's there's no accountability for anything. You can say whatever you want, and I I think that people just hide behind their screens and they just move on because it's also very trendy. Like you feel like, oh, I'm gonna chime in here even when you have no idea. What you're talking about? Um, now we're, we're gonna have Dave Smith in a few days. Where is he at? Is he is he into conspiracies? Um, well, he he tweeted some stuff, and we'll discuss it with him. Uh, that that's that seems to indicate that uh, he may he may be into certain conspiracies. He's, something about da uh, JFK and the magic bullet. He he tweeted. I think I sent you. Okay, the, now the JFK, like Paul McCartney being dead, the JFK is one of these conspiracies that. Um, I would I would put slightly outside the other conspiracies because so many serious people, including Lyndon Johnson, uh, have believed that there could be more to that story. And and there is so many weird yeah, facts about that. About what? About about the way Kennedy. Well, there's died. two aspects to that. Yeah. One is one is was there another shooter? That that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is. Did Oswald act alone? Was he under orders from the CIA or the KGB? So uh, in terms of there being another shooter, I think that's probably the more far-fetched of the, of the two conspiracies. For some reason, it's never interested me. I don't know anything about it, but go ahead. And then the other one is who gave Oswald the orders or did he act alone? So that's the second aspect of it. Dave tweeted about the first aspect of it. The magic the bullet. The magic bullet theory. Robert Kennedy, Dave Smith reposted a tweet by Robert Kennedy and just because you repost something, I don't know if that means you endorse it, but usually. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. said the magic bully th bullet theory is now dead. This preposterous construction has served as the mainstay of the theory that a single shooter murdered JFK. So Robert Kennedy coming out against the idea that a single shooter uh, murdered JFK. Dave Smith re reposted it. We'll certainly discuss that. Wait, so he's saying that it was not a single shooter? Well, Robert Kennedy is saying yeah, that's what, what Dave I'm... Smith is saying. I have no idea. So, But there was there was a book that came out like, 15 years ago already, or maybe more, that was supposed to be the definitive research on the Kennedy thing that concluded once again that Oswald acted alone. People love a good conspiracy theory, too. I think that's a lot of what's going that's on. A lot of, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I would have liked there to be a second gunman. That would have been damn interesting. Uh, but That's what's there, going on you know, with Israel, too, though, is that... There, you know, usually these things are something that happens to somebody far away in a land you've never been to. It's some story and there's a narrative, right? Like you understand life in terms of a narrative. There's a bad guy and there's a good guy and then there's an underdog and everything else. All the facts, especially now that don't fit that storyline, don't really matter that much. Say it again. Yeah, I'm not going. <laughs> um <laughs> Why were you not listening? <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> Zoned main, out. <laughs> the main reason conspiracy theories don't generally hold is because large numbers of people can't keep a secret. The amount of people that would have to keep a secret for for these for these theories to be valid is just untenable. Yeah, of course. I, I, that's why I don't believe them. I don't believe the Kennedy conspiracy theory for, for that reason. Uh, but and you, what about Epstein? That's also we've been g gone back and forth I, on that. Yeah, I don't one, believe that one either. That's one that I really don't believe, and I know a lot of people believe that one. I do not believe Epstein was murdered. Yeah, in hundred percent was murdered. I do not believe that. I, of course, you believe that. So I have a lot of good company in that belief. Well, you right? have a lot of company, and I believe the other one I don't believe is that Jesse Smollett made up his. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so with Epstein. First of all, I know it's ridiculous that the camera wasn't working. Yeah. But if I told you how many times in my own 
business life when we needed the camera, whatever it wasn't working, you you would uh, you just freak out. It's it's such a common thing to have a half-assed organization that's just not on top of these things. But obviously, there's way more cameras in that prison than just the ones in his room. Every single person that comes in and out of the prison is on camera. They checked it. Um, it just does. It seems implausible to me that he was murdered. There would have been screaming. He, you know, he would have he would have put up. How do you fight. know there wasn't though? Well, that's that's the answer to every conspiracy. How do you know? I don't. You can't. You can. You could say. You could come up with anything well, your also, imagination there are, there are comes up with. Believe, how do you know that didn't happen? There are people that believe the Clintons gave the order, which to add another outlandish layer to to that. Um, well, I also have another. Another um I think Jonathan is here. There's another thing about the whole Epstein thing that I that I believe I don't have any basis for this except certain common sense, which is that I know that Epstein was into young girls. Girls. He was a uh an ephebophile, right? But a phebophile? Yeah, as opposed to a pedophile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't think that there's any evidence that those people who joined him on his island shared his sickness or would have done such a thing openly. I feel much more likely when they were on his island, they were hooked up with grown up. Uh, uh, Hi, John, come sit down. Hooked up with grown up sexual dalliances. I certainly ex- expect Bill Clinton to have done that. And um, so, so, therefore, the whole idea that they'd have him murdered. Bill Clinton, I don't think there. He, he didn't have Monica Lewinsky murdered. Why would he have Epstein? No, no, no. Murdered? But there, but Epstein <laughs> provided like numerous young girls. It wasn't like you went there and there was like adult women to this island. Like there were like a bunch of teenage girls there. No, no, you don't. You don't know that. And uh, okay, let's not. Uh, Jonathan, you want to join a conversation like that? <laughs> uh, we have with us, and we're privileged. Privileged to have with us. I, uh, this is his second. Day. He was here with us years ago. Years ago, but then he became like kind of. Okay. I think you kind of became famous right when you, when you were. We visiting made him us. famous, and then and then <laughs> we can't get. We couldn't get him back. Nobody knew who I was until I appeared. Is on your mic working? Is his mic working? Well, you, I don't know. let's see. Is it? Turn is him it? up. Turn him up, Max. Okay. Also, I have a little. I have like a weird thing on my vocal cord, so I have to speak not too loud. Yeah, so and, I'll, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll 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 deaf, right so I need you. I need you nice and loud. Okay, but in any case, uh, Jonathan Haidt. Is that, is that a polyp? Height. I told. I corrected him. Sorry, sorry. Yes, Jonathan. It's, it's a little polyp. Yeah, it's a little nodule. They say. Can, can I tell you one story before you introduce him? Because you'll like this. So years ago, Amy Schumer had, I, I think, a, a nodule. So she asked me for this is before she was super famous. So she's already a little famous. She asked me for the name because I've been a musician. I knew so many singers. Do you know anybody who, like who's the best doctor for these mm-hmm. nodules? So I. Sent her the name of the doctor, Doctor Nodell, uh, and kidding, that <laughs> day, literally that next no day, cool. that was the doctor that killed Joan Rivers. <laughs> 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 in that, you know, but she, she, Joan Rivers died in a in a mishap. Okay, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes, Jonathan <laughs> Height. and but and speaking of which, he's taller than I remembered. But John's taller. What are you like six three? Six two. Six Shrinking two. now six one. But you have room to shrink. I don't. I'm, I'm, <laughs> but Jonathan Height is with us. He is a social social psychologist a professor at New York University and author of several books, including The Righteous Mind, The Coddling of the American Mind, and his latest tome, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. Welcome, John Height. Height. Thank you, gentlemen. And who who am I talking this to here? Periel. Oh, yeah. Oh, Periel. Oh, very good. Hello, Periel. Yeah, you've Hello. been gone a long time. You know, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, 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 Calabria with us anymore. Yeah, it's Calabria's gone. So... All right, I'm a parent. I have an 11 year old, a mm-hmm. 10 year old, and a six year old. And mm-hmm. your boy is my boy is 17. My daughter is 14. I don't know your daughter, so, uh, so and and you won't. So I would. So um, uh, rather than ask you questions, why don't you tell us what is top on your mind on your book and what we need mm-hmm. to know uh, f- for all these parents raising kids now? Because yeah. this this issue scares the hell out of me. Yeah. So I think what's top of mind is to realize um, human children need to grow up playing, you know, for, for, you know, 50, 70 million years, primate babies played. That's what we do to wire up our brains until about 2010. Then we stopped that. Uh, we began cutting down on it in the 90s, overprotecting. But in 2010, when, the, when, when um, a millennial kid traded in her flip phone 
for a smartphone and then went through puberty on Instagram, she became the very first member of Gen Z. Because if you go through puberty on social media, especially if you're a girl, it's going to mess with your development. It's going to mess with your your identity, your sexual identity. Um, and so Gen Z is just really different from the millennials. And what we have to do is restore the play-based childhoods. That's really what the book is about, how we got into this mess. And then some pretty simple things we can do to end the phone-based childhood and give kids back a play-based childhood. Can I just ask, before we get into that, uh, was, was there a similar... Uh, mental health crisis when we when the TV generation came along? And- no, there wasn't. There wasn't. And it turns out, so that this is part of the reason I think we've been so slow to act here, is that we're in the, we're in the, the boy who cried wolf. And every time a new technology comes in and young people embrace it, older people say, oh my God, it's going to destroy them. It's the work of the devil, you know, comic books and, and video games and television, all that. And because none of those were true, Many researchers now say, oh, this is just another moral panic. And like, oh, you know, the data is kind of ambiguous. Like, no, nothing's going on there, they say. But what I've learned is that television, while it did make us passive, um, you you sat there and you were passive, but it was a large screen compared to what we have now. You usually watched it with other kids, your siblings or friends, so there was some social element. And a television can't train you the way an animal trainer trains a dog. Whereas once we gave kids t- the touch screen, now you have this behaviorist psychology cycle where the, the kid sees something, they touch something, they get a reward. They see something, they touch them, they get a reward. That's how you train a dog to do circus tricks in an hour. Yeah. And that's what social media is able to do to our kids. So I have two questions about that. But first, I just want to say, I coined a name for the argument you just made many okay. years ago. I called it the Elvis argument. All right, lay it and, out. And, and the argument is always, it's like a, yes, in the 50s, <laughs> when parents were freaking out about Elvis, they were wrong. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm wrong when I don't want my kid to see simulated intercourse on MTV today. Just because it's been wrong in the past, uh, it's tempting to say, oh, that's what they all said, but you still have to show that it's wrong today. Mm -hmm. And it's sloppy thinking. The Boy Who Cried Wolf is a good enough uh, name for that. Anyway, so I call it the Elvis art. So there's, in my mind, and because I can attach it to each of my children, there's the lack of play, mm-hmm. which I worry about in my son, and then there is the kind of n- bad mental atmosphere and indoctrination of my daughter, who's already post-pubescent, who's, she's already past the age of playing. You know, she's at the age where she'd be hanging out with her friends. How old is she? She's, she's 11, but she, she's about to be 12, a little bit of an early bloomer. They still play. They still play a lot in middle school. But not, but you're, but she's not running around in the backyard playing like maybe she would be. She could be, but I mean, they are, but they're, but they are definitely in different. They are mm-hmm. definitely in different places. And I remember in the book you said something about boys have failure to launch. Mm-hmm. Right. So it well, I mean, I, I'll ask you: Are they all the same thing, or mm-hmm. are there are there two separate problems yeah. here? Because because what my daughter seems to be going through is what seems to me will follow her through adulthood. Mm-hmm. This kind of you know young girls in their 20s are also very badly affected by this stuff. That's right, that's right. So what we have to see is this is a complete rewiring of childhood. This is not like we changed one thing. Um, And so that's what I call it in the book is the great rewiring of childhood. And it happened between 2010 and 2015. It was the most rapid change in human consciousness in human history. And it had different effects on average on boys and girls. Uh, So for girls, there's lots of evidence, I review lots of evidence that social media is the main culprit. Now, there's a lot more going on. But social media harms girls in about seven different ways. So for some girls, they end up getting uh, bullied. And if you are shamed on social media, it's so much more painful to have everyone talking about you than it was you know, in the old days when it was seven people talking about you. Um, you know, in one, in one story I read, uh, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, an Instagram group was formed, Everybody But Cheryl, like You know, everyone in the grade forms this group to exclude this one kid. And I guarantee you, that kid was thinking about suicide. That's almost the definition. When you feel social death, for a 12-year-old, social death is much worse than physical death because physical death is an end of suffering, but social death is the most powerful suffering, and it goes on and on. And that's just one harm method. Then there's the self-comparison. There's the perfectionism, which hits a lot of girls. Um, There's the beauty standards that are impossible. So girls are really getting slaughtered by social media in about seven different ways. Um, Boys, it was a lot harder to understand because I couldn't, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's video games. And 
And the evidence on video games is very mixed. Some studies show some benefits for moderate use. Some show some harm. Um, so it took us longer to figure out. This is work I did with Zach Rausch, my, my research assistant. And you know what? we really went deep into what's happening to boys. And the bottom line for boys is that boys really need rough and tumble play more than girls. Boys are nonconformist. They're physical. They can't sit still as much. You know, they're more likely to have ADHD. They mature slower. So for all these reasons, boys need more recess. They need more running around time. Now, we began to crack down on that in the 70s and 80s, we, especially in the 80s after uh, one of the uh, Nation at Risk report. I forget which report. There were some major reports saying, oh, my God, we're falling behind Singapore. We need to, you know, kids need to do homework all the time. So we began cutting recess, um, uh, lengthening the school year. Uh, for a ri- variety of reasons, boys began kind of withdrawing from, you know, from, the, from the real world, from school, because just at that time, home computers came in, and it was boys, not girls, who were interested in that. And video games come in. Again, boys, not girls. And then the internet comes in. And it, that, too, is mostly boys, not girls, until the internet gets super social with Facebook and all those things. Then we even out everybody's online all the time. So anyway, just to keep it short, um, the problem for boys is not social media specifically or video games specifically. It's that they have withdrawn from the real world to such an extent that they don't develop social skills they don't develop executive control, the ability to focus. They don't develop ambition. Uh, and sex is so easy with incredible resolution online, and it's so hard in real life with girls who are anxious and politicized and fragile. So it, you know, it's, a, it's a whole mess, and it's going to be very hard to see how boys and girls and, and men and women get together in the future. Because of porn. Well, be, porn pulls away the boys. The boys then don't ever cultivate any skills that would make a woman respond to them. Uh, you know, I talk with my students at NYU, and you know, it's, I think it seems universally the case that on dating apps, like, you know, the young men are the ones who really need boot camp. They really need to, like, learn some basic things. Do you tell your students to go downtown? What do you mean, go, is that, what do you mean by that? Well, sexually speak. Dan, Dan. I think we're not quite at that uh, level of advice in my class, but (laughs) I'll I'll take that into consideration. (laughs) And, 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 you know, he doesn't even have the excuse of being raised on screens. Go ahead. (laughs) He actually did have a a child, but he still doesn't know what to say. Go ahead. Um, But, yeah, so we, we have to just, we have to see that, you know, it used to be that to get like to get sex, a boy had to develop some skills of approaching girls, and it was really scary. I mean, do you, you probably yeah. remember what it was like, like you know, the stupid high school dances. Like it's incredibly awkward, but you get up the guts to approach a girl, and now they don't have a chance to learn that. In fact, they say nobody. They say I would never dream of approaching a girl in public. That's like creepy, and you could be reported for that. Everything goes through the apps. But but and the dating app. That's got to be terrifying because you put yourself out mm-hmm. there, and if you don't get picked, your self-esteem is crushed. Mm-hmm. And by the way, in my experience, you know the dating app only gives you superficial things to go on. So of course, the girl's going to choose the guy who has the best mm-hmm. picture. But in real life, that melts away pretty quickly, yeah. and you would see you know but, couples forming that you wouldn't expect mm-hmm. because they meet each other, they get to know That's each right. other. But if I can make a case yeah. for 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 online being some guys. Are terrible in person. I'll put myself in that category, <laughs> but really can shine bright like the sun <laughs> via text messaging. Uh, because I have a joke about that, which I won't talk about. But but um, you know, I think this this gives a chance to some of the more, maybe the more shy kids. That I think I would have done much better uh, with with girls had uh, had that had texting been around and had. I had um, Facebook been around when I was in college. Well, it's certainly, so it, it, it seems like it would allow you to use your strength, which is humor, and that's true. But what what emerges when you when you put a bunch of young men and women together on this is a kind of a marketplace where um, the 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 women are mostly looking for a few traits. There's a you know you know well educated, high income. They care a lot about looks as the men do, and so the market is such that a small number of men get all the all the responses, and they can have sex with two different women a day every day, uh, whereas the great majority of men get no responses whatsoever. But that sort of was his case anyway. No, it was not. It was never. It was never that you know the, the top five guys could literally have fourteen women a week, but now they could. And it was never the case that the bottom 80% could have like one date a year. So it really is distorted in a way that is incredibly discouraging to boys. And if you want to understand the incel phenomena, these young men, you know, men going their own way. I lived it for quite a (laughs) few years. (laughs) 
All right. Well, so what do you, I mean, yeah, what do you, you lived it, you mean, when you were well, I was before in college. the college. I was a virgin until the age of uh, 22, I believe it was. And even then it was a, 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 an exchange, it was a professional woman. So I didn't have any sex, real sex, till 27, believe it or not. You know, he's not a mm. therapist. He's a psychologist. <laughs> right. I'm just, just giving you some background. But, but anyway, um, I th- but again, I think I, I so I had nowhere to go but up. I mean, the internet could have only helped me. I mean, how do you get worse than that, right? Well, you in my, maybe you're saying yeah. I'm an extreme case. I'm an outlier, and I don't figure in the sti- statistics, which I'll which mm-hmm. which may be the case. Yeah. Well, because because if when you're on the internet, everything is quantified, and and you know that you're a complete loser on the internet for most of the boys because. If you, you know, it's one thing if, you know, how many times did you approach a woman? Like once a week, once a month? Never. I was okay. too scared. Right. So your batting average Same amount was, of time I swung you know, at the ball in Little League. Right. Okay. So now imagine that you took, uh, you took 500 swings a day and you missed every one at day after day. Yeah, that would have been worse. That would have been worse. And that is worse. So it's just much more discouraging for, for boys. Now for girls, it's, you know, it's not good for, for women either. Um, you know, it just, I mean, the internet, you know, it enables just so much harassment, so many perverts. I mean... It's you know it's one thing if you're a young an adult woman and you kind of expect that you should be able to handle that although you shouldn't have to face it, but you know there was recently a report by a, a guy who worked at Facebook Antonio Bejar his 14 year old daughter started an Instagram page because she was fixing up old cars with him and they thought that was cool they put it online they got a good response, but it turns out that she would constantly be approached by creeps and perverts and there was no way to report that on Facebook on on Instagram, uh, and Bejar then wrote a memo to Mark Zuckerberg um, and Adam Mosseri laying out exactly what was happening. Here's what we need to do. If we could just have a button to report this inappropriate approach, we could get data on it and we could, we could discourage it. And they got the memo. They did nothing. So these sites, they, you know, they've known for a long time that girls are really being torn, you know, chewed up here, and they just haven't done anything. Also, eating so, disorders, right? That, yet another one. That's right. There are so many different avenues of harm. That's right. So when does this all cross the line, despite the First Amendment, into a, a product which is dangerous mm-hmm. that needs to be regulated by the government, in your mind? Oh, crossed that line long ago. Although, because the scientific evidence wasn't so clear even five years ago, I understand why we didn't act. Um, I, I have many libertarian tendencies. I signed that Westminster Declaration opposing you know, censorship on the internet, because I don't think we should be thinking about the internet as a free speech thing where regulation is stopping some people from saying some things. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are architectural features and age gating, age limits. So just as, you know, we don't let, we don't let 12 year olds hang out in bars or strip clubs or, you know, um, uh, you know, we don't let them sign up for uh, skydiving or base jumping. There's all kinds of things we don't let companies do to children especially without their parents' knowledge or consent. Yet somehow we've thought, well, you know, kids are going to get onto porn, so let them go to Pornhub when they're 11. Let them learn about anal sex before they, they ever go to 11. They, they ask them, how old are you? And it no, <laughs> actually, they don't even. And some, some of the sites do say, are, you, know, are, you know, you have to be 18. Are you 18? Yes. Yeah. But some don't even ask. It's crazy. But then how do you it's it's crazy. technologically it's uh, prevent a, an underage person from going on a porn mm-hmm. site? What's the technology yeah. that you would need yeah, to use? That's right. So we, 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 we will eventually need to age gate. We either need to age gate the internet or we need to keep kids off until they're 18. Now, I don't want that latter one to be the case, uh, but we're going to have to get serious about age gating. And what I propose in the book is a very simple solution. It's not perfect, but it, it causes no trouble for anyone whatsoever. It's very simple. Um, it's device-based authentication. I didn't invent this. I'm just channeling it. Um, basically, if you're a parent now and you want to keep your kid off of these bad sites, good luck. There's very little you can do. Um, but what if you could give your kid a phone where either you set a switch in software or it was in hardware, basically saying, you know, I'm a minor. And so when, that, when, uh, when the kid tries to go using her phone, using her computer, using her iPad, whatever it is, when she tries to go to either Pornhub or Instagram or anywhere, and she's 12, it's the the site can check the machine because they know what you know they, they, there's all kinds of communication between the site and the machine the site can check oh this is an underage uh, phone but this is oh, it's a device based now yeah, the, device based that's very now easy. here's an idea maybe you have like you know uh retinal scan um and every well that that gets into i guess issues of privacy but like you know like if you're 21 mm-hmm. uh, you know you can they the internet knows who you are 
like a fa- face. Yeah, those things are technically think. possible. Then that gets creepy, yeah. and then you get into all Never kinds mind. of privacy I don't know what I, issues. Yeah, so yeah. I, my, I use yeah. Google uh, Family Link on mm-hmm. my phone, and that's pretty good. I can okay. I can shut down a lot of things. I can see exactly what the kids are looking at. Oh, I, okay. can, I can schedule it. It's not as good as I'd like it to be. But, uh, Wait, does this I, work on, on Apple, or is this for Android? I have Android. I, okay. I, it might work on Apple as well. I okay. Yeah, and, I mean, Apple and, does give us some things in Google. Right, yeah. so Apple and Google, I think, are at least trying to help us as parents. But I do know that, in a certain way, it's futile. If, if, if she gets it in her head that she's going to want, she's going to go to some kid's house, they're going to have some mm-hmm. computer. Right, that's the problem, yeah. too, is that, you know, you're not always with them, right? Yeah. And so they go to somebody's house. Mm-hmm. And they that person has an older sibling mm-hmm. or yeah. who knows what, and it's it's impossible. So now, so now there's a whole other thing that's, that's right. worrying me now. And by the way, I, I do want to say that my kids have gotten an enormous amount good from screens. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like like you know how aggregate statistics and economics can mm-hmm. can mask things. Yeah. So if like the suicide rates are going up, say the phones are obviously bad, but that doesn't mean that every kid is having mm-hmm. getting bad things from screens. Like my son Manny. He's all into chat GPT mm-hmm. and he's, you know, he's back and forth with it. And is no question in my mind, it's, it's enriching for him and he's learning from it and mm-hmm. his, his imagination is, is kicking in. So yeah. there, but my daughter, I say she gets nothing good from screens. She's on TikTok mm-hmm. and yeah. the, the stuff that she's looking at is superficial. Mm-hmm. But what I'm worried about now, and this overlaps with the political climate, is this indoctrination. That's right. This bin Laden thing scared yeah. me. I don't know what she's seeing about Hamas. That's right. There's conspiracy theories going around now that Israel, that uh, that Hamas didn't even actually kill these people. Right. It's a false flag operation. And, Any, yeah. and, and, you know, I don't know how to prevent her from seeing yeah. that stuff. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Well, so I, I think we have to, because the, so if you think about when kids are most impressionable, when is the brain wiring up? And the brain is changing very rapidly in the first two years of life. But it's really basic stuff like walking and talking and vision in the first few years. Uh, and then it kind of slows down, and it doesn't really grow. And then, you know, um, and then you hit puberty, and then you get it begins wiring up, as rewiring for the adult pattern from more from the back of the brain. The frontal cortex is the last part to wire up. So you know, early puberty, the first half of puberty, is the worst possible time to expose your kid to bad influences. And what do we do? Um, we say, okay, you know, you're about to hit puberty, you're 10 or 11, that's what we do in this country, here you go, here's a device, and you can take it into your bedroom, and, and, and you can fall down into the rabbit hole, and, and not all kids will fall down, but, you know, 10, 20% will, and can you imagine a consumer product, I suppose there was a toy or a candy bar that, that really damaged 10 or 20% of our kids, like, we'd never allow that to happen, but that's what's happening. So how long should you wait to get your kid a phone? So, okay, so let me bring up the key idea here, which is why we, the key idea of the book is that we're all stuck in, a collect, in many collective action problems. So I could answer that question from an individual point of view, and I would say, you know, probably 18. Like, you know, at 18, you're more mature, you know, you could, you could, handle, you could handle this. Um, but the reason why everyone gives their kid a phone at 11 is because she says, Dad, everyone else has a phone and I'm being left out. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do in the book is solve the collective action problem. And so I'm trying to give some just very clear norms. These are not the ideal, but they are norms that would raise, that make things so much better. So there are four of them. They're very simple. Uh, the first is no phone till high school, no smartphone till high school. Just give them a flip phone. Yeah. Flip phones are for communication. That's all they can do, text yeah. and phone. So flip phones are okay. But no, nobody give your your kid a smartphone till high school. If we could all do that, then you know. Well, how, but you can't enforce that legally. So then, how do you? No, it's a norm, and it doesn't have to be a hundred percent. If we can get seventy percent to not give, then what are they going to do? Mom, you have to give me a phone. Thirty percent of the kids have one. Like, no, that's not a good enough argument. So that would take the pressure off parents. Now, how okay. do you propose to uh, make this norm, bring this norm, you know, make it a reality? Mm-hmm. I mean, your yeah. book, I'm sure, is selling well. But most people don't are not going to read the book. So I'm in the enviable position that I don't have to persuade people of something. It's not like I'm going to try to say, oh, you know, uh, you know, have to persuade people that you know cigarettes are bad or something when they don't believe it. Almost everybody sees the problem. Right. All the teachers, almost all the parents, all the psychiatrists, psychologists, sports coaches, principals, everybody sees the problem. They just don't. They need a coordination system. They need a clear norm 
And so I'm hopeful that when my book comes out March 26th, it'll say, look, you know, let's understand what's going on with our kids' brains. Let's understand why we all hate this, but yet we're stuck in it. And let's break the hell out of this. I, th- can I, you con- I'm sorry, do you mind if I no, no, can you I, convince parents and Periel that Periel's a parent that uh, well, uh, uh, that um their kids are not going to get kidnapped and abducted every time they leave the house? I I had a little argument mm-hmm. with some parents recently because I was prepared to let my daughter mm-hmm. get on a train mm-hmm. and maybe make her way from Grand Central to to, mm-hmm. the, to the Comedy Cellar because I did mm-hmm. it at that age. Right. I can track her on her phone. Because I want her to to uh, uh, begin to be independent. Exactly. To, to, exactly. Uh, In to four take, years. Take contro- to take right. control of her ability yeah. to do things, not mm-hmm. be scared. That's right. And when I was her age, when there were no phones, I'd say, okay. And that, there was a lot more crime. And it was a lot more It was much more, more dangerous. Drunk drivers, perverts. Yeah. It was much more dangerous and than they're 70s together, when they were growing up. Yeah. And they'll be fine. Yep. And they will be. But she, look at her face. Can you, can, can you tell me how, how old are your kids, Periel? I have one and he's 10. Okay. And Do you let him out? Is, can he walk around without an adult chaperone? In the no. city? Yeah. No. Where do you live? On the Upper West Side. Would you let him walk two blocks to uh, no. Why not? What's going to happen? Um, well, right now there is a mentally unstable homeless man that lives so on what? our corner. How many, children, how many children get attacked by homeless people? Have you ever heard of that? For some uh, reason, I don't know why, but for some reason homeless people, you know, People no, it's not all, it's they not, don't seem to attack children. No. Well, it's not. I mean, first of all, you you might be right, but I mean, there. I grew up in Queens. Look, she's backfilling the reason. It's not no, no, because no. of the homeless guy. Mm-hmm. No, I'm just. No, okay. he asked me why. When we, when we were in I'm Maine, st- you wouldn't let him walk uh, mm-hmm. by himself to the arcade in in one of the safest neighborhoods oh, that, on yeah, God's okay. earth. I mean, if you ever read any Stephen yeah. King novels, Maine is, <laughs> Maine is the worst. Yeah, place. no, I wouldn't. I mean, okay. I why, would. Yeah, why not? Because I'm scared something bad is right. going that's to right. happen. To you him. are scared. That's right. We're all scared something that's bad. That's why. Happen. Right. So this do happened. You think this happened in the nineties. Twelve year old on the on Grand to make her way, snake her way from Grand Central. Oh to- yeah, what a, that is a great thing to do. That is a great thing to do. So look, let me give you the stats on kidnapping. Um, kidnapping is almost unheard of in this country. The number of kids who are kidnapped, it's almost always by the non-custodial parent yeah, if there's a divorce. So if you look at the number of true kidnappings, like the FBI reports, like abducted by a stranger, it's around 100 a year. And a third of them are never reported missing because it's throwaway kids. It's kids who don't have married parents, who don't have parents. So kidnapping is zero point. It's not an issue in the United States. Now, if you're in, in, you know, in Latin America, there are or many countries where you would have to do that. America's not such a place. So how would you feel about Periel um, instructing the child on the proper use of a firearm? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's... it's so, no. Listen, he, he talks... Maybe it's it, not rational. I mean, maybe it's yeah. really... But it's, it's, not, but it's, it's not, dangerous yeah. because he talks in the book, I'll let him speak for himself, about failure to launch. And mm-hmm. as, soon as, I heard, it stuck, as soon as I read that, I'm like, yeah, this is... I could see this happening to my kids mm-hmm. because... They're just they're it, they're like being raised in a in a Skinner box. Yeah. There is no, no world in which you can convince me that a twelve year old girl is not that it's not that it's completely not, safe to let with her. A group well, nothing of girls. is completely yeah. safe, of course. Wait, 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 finish your sentence. What what would you let a twelve year old girl walk twelve blocks in the Upper West Side by herself? Yeah, or by her herself. friends? No, by herself. Would you let a twelve year old girl walk what by herself? What time? Mm, f- four o'clock in the afternoon. You're not sure. Why aren't you sure? But just this... They're gonna... just wait, wait, think about what you're saying here. All the way up to 12, your child needs a chaperone to walk in a very safe neighborhood in daylight. And when you were 12, when you were 10, no. were you able to... You weren't able to walk outside? No. By myself? Well, we used to no go way. trick or... At, in fifth grade? No way. Wait, how old are you? I'm in my 40s, but okay. I grew up in Queens in like the 80s and 90s. Kids were not, when I was a little bit older than that, like when I was like mm-hmm. 15, I was taking the subway by myself from Queens into Manhattan. Um, but I think there's a very big difference between 15 and 12. Yeah. And when we were growing up, you know, I mean, kids would, you'd, you'd walk around in your neighborhood. Kids who grew up in New York were out playing stickball in the street when they were eight, nine, ten. Okay. It was, so that, it was much got, more dangerous. When I, I grew up on a uh, hundred street, I had to walk to, to PS 75, which is on 96th street. In second grade, I was walking yeah. by myself, that but was it was norm. even worse than that because at lunchtime, you could just leave the school. Yeah. 
and that's right. And go to Broadway and get lunch. Get pizza, yeah. By yourself yeah. in the second grade. And you learn to be self-supervising all around the world, right around age seven. That's when you send a cow down to the river with a boy, you know, with a seven-year-old boy. Okay. I mean, at seven, kids can take on responsibility. And that's how they gradually learn to become self-supervising. And if you want to have a democracy, it's all about self-governance. What, 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 how are we going to learn to be self-governing if we never let our kids be self-governing? I don't think that, that Perel is listening. So I think, you need, <laughs> I think you need to tell her what pernicious effects this is going to have on her child that she is being this protective. Yeah, well, there's, there's another side of the ledger, what you're risking Okay, yeah. but I think that risking? what you said really resonated. I mean, the when kid's already a little off. I when think. he's 18 and he gets a phone, he can go walk around by himself. But at no. 12? <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. But actually, so, okay, so, so wait, just to be clear, um, you know, the, my, my book and my story is not just about phones and technology. There's two parts of the story. There's the decline of play-based childhood because kids must be out playing and it must be unsupervised. Not must, but it's much more nutritious, much better we for them. Do that if they're a lot. unsupervised. No adult, because if there's an adult around, the adult won't be able to restrain herself. From I push involved. you to do that. I push you and you know we're friends. I always say, let them just they're arguing. Let them argue. Yes. Exactly. They'll be fine. But they we do. We send them outside. Yeah, they're in the backyard okay. for hours Good. by themselves. That's, okay. That's great. That's great. Uh, That's true. Okay. Go, go, Don't okay. take all the credit for that. Okay, let him continue. Okay. Go ahead. But but so uh so kids need a lot of independence um in order to learn to be independent. And that's one of the reasons that our kids are so anxious is that we deprive them of play and there's all kinds of interesting research showing that kids actually need risk and thrills. They need to be afraid. And you can see this in kids. If you ever take your kids to Coney Island, you know, there's there's all these different gradations of scary rides. And they're all talking with each other like, oh, I'm going to try the thunder, Thunderbolt today. No way. Oh, my God. That is too too scary. But then they kind of do. And then, they, and then it's, they come out ecstatic. And then they can go for something even riskier. And when kids learn to skateboard, you know, they learn to balance. But then what do they do? Once you can skateboard down a hill, you skateboard down the stairs, down the rail. Like, they, kids are dosing themselves with risk. That's how humans wire up and develop skills. And what we said to kids beginning in the 90s was, how about if you never develop skills? How about if we just keep you, you know, we'll treat you like veal, we'll feed you well, we'll worry a lot about the vegetables you're eating, but we're not going to give you what you need. Oh, and by the way, here, here's a device. You can watch anal sex all day long. On oh, my I mean, you God. know, it's like, it's insane what we've done to childhood. Well, by the way, Noam reprimanded me for bringing up going downtown. This guy's talking about anal sex. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, all right. Well, this it, this this worries me very much. By the way, you, I, I don't know if, if this is um, allowed. If it, if what I'm about to say, which is off topic, is allowed, but you tell me if you like. When you talked about this social pressure, to me, peer pressure. It's been something I've been thinking about for many, many years mm-hmm. now. And I give a little example, and it, it ties in with what's going on now with Israel. For many, many years, I have friends who say they're center-left and friends who say they're center-right. Mm-hmm. And I personally say, really, what's the difference? Like, like you, have, you need a magnifying glass to understand mm-hmm. what they really disagree about. I think the minimum wage should be 13. No, 1250. Mm-hmm. You know, center-left, center-right. But what I noticed about them is if they felt they were center-left, it was very difficult for them to say anything publicly that might sound like they were pro-Israel. Mm-hmm. Not that they privately they would. But how long ago was this that you noticed this? I noticed this four or five years ago. Yeah, right. Okay, but yeah. really now. Yeah, and it's, and I would say, stop calling yourself center left because all you're doing is mm-hmm. buying into this peer pressure. I said, I I, I consider myself center right. We don't really disagree on policies, mm-hmm. but I don't give a shit what they think about me. Mm-hmm. And what we're seeing now, I mean, I know quite a few pretty influential Jewish columnists. And I know what they're saying uh, and how they feel about what's going on. They will not write wholehearted columns mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. talking about what's going on in the way that they feel about it mm. because, the I believe, because the peer pressure is is getting the better of them. Yeah, that's right. And this is, this is very dangerous for the Jewish mm-hmm. people, actually. That's right. It's incredibly dangerous. So the... So, you know, as a social psychologist, I think primarily about how we're affecting each other. And we all understand what peer pressure is, and we all under you know, journalists, I think, are generally pretty brave people, much braver than professors. They write things, those things are sometimes unpopular, and then people say bad things about them. That's always been the case. But now let's go back to, um, to 2009, when Twitter uh, adds the retweet button, and Facebook adds the like button and the share button. 
Uh, before 2009, the internet was not super viral. So, uh, but, but with those innovations in 2009, the internet becomes super duper viral. Before then, we called these things social networking systems because you could use them to connect with people. After that, we call them social media platforms because everyone is standing on their platform, shouting, attacking, shaming. Um, and so 2009 is when the internet really changes in a really, really sick way. Before then, the internet, we all thought it was going to be great for democracy. It's going to be this amazing thing. And it was an amazing thing. It really was. But it's the, it's the move to virality that changed everything. And so to go back to your example, suppose you're a columnist before 2009, you write something, and then people write in angry letters. Maybe they do a blog post about how terrible you are, maybe. But by 2013, now Twitter has become basically a, you know, a little like machine gun shooting darts that everybody, everybody has a gun, everybody can shoot anybody, and if you're on the left, what they shoot you with is the word racist or sexist or whatever, or homophobic or transphobic. So people on the left, center left or far left, they cannot say anything. They cannot dissent about even a little bit on matters related to race, gender, immigration, a few other hot button topics, because they will be sh like shot full of darts. It's really, really painful. Um, and so that is what I think led to the spectacular collapse of courage among leaders in all of our epistemic institutions. Epistemic just meaning knowledge creating. So, you know, university um, presidents, uh, you know, were not necessarily known for courage. I mean, there were some really courageous ones in the 60s, but man, it's been unbelievable to me the way students can do the most outrageous violations of basic academic norms. Uh, they can shout down, you know, they can threaten, they can intimidate, and nothing happens to them. The presidents won't do anything. Um, there's been a spectacular collapse of courage. Uh, journalists are l less so. The journalists still do take risks, but they are too, like what happened in the New York Times with Barry Weiss. You know, so, so yes, the, it's the change in the media environment, and especially Twitter and other things like it, um, that have really changed the way we interact with each other and that have led to much, much greater conformity pressure. That's what I was getting back to, is peer pressure, conformity pressure was your point. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a little experience with it when <clears throat> I had my whole controversy when Louis came back. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like 20, 30 people were tweeting at me, mm -hmm. and I really did feel like the whole world yeah. was coming down on me. Yeah. It, jar it was jarring. And yeah. imagine I, if I, you're 12 and yes, that happens. Yes, so exactly, cool. exactly. Or 16. Yeah. Before, but I, but I, I'm, I'm talking about adults now. I, I, right, I understand yeah, that, but yeah. you're a grown-up mm -hmm. who has a whole world around you. You are secure, mm -hmm. you're safe, you're... Twitter, Twitter yeah. I don't think, is necessarily... Uh, a plate. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think younger kids generally are not on Twitter. No, but Instagram no, but, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's right. I mean, all, all this happens on Instagram as well. They're mostly yeah, Instagram is the big one, and TikTok is the worst in terms of what they see. Yeah, Instagram is the worst in terms of the social dynamics mm -hmm. and the bullying. I just get the feeling that back in the old days, if somebody was going to write a column that was going to be a little controversial, they weren't. They weren't up nights like, oh God, yeah. like, yeah. like, what, right. what's going to happen? Like you say, right. some letters, somebody will complain about, it, and then I'll go back to work the next day. Yeah. And also, we've talked about this before. It was a newspaper; it would go in the garbage, mm -hmm. and the yeah. half life was very quick. That's right. If you even wanted right. to find it again, you had to go to the library, get, get the microfiche. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh my God, that's right. So, so it disappeared. Now you can wow. just bring it up. Yeah. So it's forever. Yeah, so you right. can really hang it around somebody. Well, like uh, like Shane Gillis, you know, when he was hired for SNL, they dug deep into all his podcasts and his tweets, right. and they found tweets on on I think no uh, uh, Trevor Noah when he was hired. I said, well, look what he said six years ago. He tweeted, you know, something mm -hmm. about this about or that. Jews. I think it was about <laughs> Jews. But anyway, um, and, and Gillis ended up, uh, you know, getting unhired from SNL as a right. result of old right. But he laughed it's, last. It's called grievance yes, he archaeology. He did. He did. Grievance archaeology. Grievance yep. archaeology. Yeah, the word for it. So before we go, um, also sort of on Israel, uh, on the commentary podcast, what's his name? Abe Greenwald. I don't know if you listen to it. It's a pretty good commentary podcast. Um, he engaged in a little pop psychology trying to um, understand why it is that people seemed to be taking Hamas's mm -hmm. side. Yeah, And what he, he say? quoted something from Cormac McCarthy. I don't know if you, who, um, have you ever read any Cormac McCarthy? I All just, the Pretty Horses. Have right? you read it? Mm -hmm. it I, well, I'll just say, I, I started reading some of his books. It's the most challenging literature I've ever read in my life. Every paragraph has a word I need to look up. And my vocabulary is not the best, but it's not bad. But uh, it's very, but anyway... It's kind of worth the effort. But there's a quote here. It says, The wicked know that if the ill they do be of sufficient horror that men will not speak against it, 
Did I read that right? The wicked know that if the ill, if that if they ill they do be of sufficient horror, that men will not speak against it. That men have just enough stomach for small evils, mm. and only these will they oppose. Mm. Mm. I, in, which I took to mean that when you do something that horrible, in somehow like you know you hear about mm. where uh, women who are beaten. They, mm-hmm. they, I've heard it described. They say, "Well, he must. If he would do something that awful to me, he must mm-hmm. love me because oh, yeah. he had." Yeah. Uh, no, no, this is all bullshit. It, this all bullshit, yeah, right? I think so. I mean, it yeah. sounds good. Yeah, and it's, it's couched in language that you have to strain to understand. No, I don't think that's that's right at all. No, I think if you want to understand why Hamas is so popular, I mean, right? If it was the Palestinian cause, maybe you could understand. But it's literally Hamas for a lot of them. Um, what you have to understand, I believe is the way that reality has fragmented so much. There is no shared reality within each bubble, and because the, the technology allows us to have these really intense bubbles that, that shape, your, shape everything you think. Um, within these intense bubbles, within many of them, they came pre-structured with this idea, this, this morality. In, in the Kali in the American mind, we called it common enemy identity politics. The idea that the world is divided into groups. Uh, these groups are, can be ranked in terms of power. That means that anyone who's high is bad because they are oppressors, and anyone who's low is good because they are victims, heroically resisting. So if many young people, especially at Ivy League schools, uh, the, the most elite schools, this is the rule, less elite schools or schools in the South, Southwest, you don't get this very much, but in you know the Northeast, West Coast, um, the, the you know, students who are majoring in the humanities, the social sciences, they come believing that that they sort of grafted onto their onto their you know the lens of their eyes is a filter that looks at everything in terms of groups and oppressors oppressed. So that's why you saw the celebrations on October seventh and eighth because people said this is what decolonization looks like. Finally, the powerless are fighting back against the powerful. Also, there's an American sickness which is. Because, because of our terrible history of slavery and racism, that has come to define the moral struggle for the left. And many concepts that made sense in the Jim Crow South, like structural racism, oh yeah, I mean, that was, that's exactly what it was. Those concepts have been incorporated into progressive thought. So they see everything in terms of structural this, structural that, oppressors, everything's black and white. And they've assimilated the Israel-Palestine issue to is, you know, Jews are white, even though most of them are actually from the Middle East in Israel, um, and the, the Palestinians are people of color. So once you have these crude categories, they don't see human beings, they don't see babies, they don't see toddlers being shot in front of their parents, they don't see parents being shot in front of their children, they don't see that. Or if they do, they just sort of, you know, somehow they're able to look past it. So I think we have to understand the power of a group to shape your perception of reality was always powerful, and once everyone got online, it became a hundred times more powerful. Yeah, and and you're seeing real. We talked about it on the show before. Real dehumanization of the kind that I've never seen before yeah, in my that's life, right. where that's right. it was just never considered uh, acceptable in polite company. If somebody said, "But but you do have a problem with the fact that babies were dismembered," mm-hmm. any decent person, mm-hmm. even if it was just for appearances, would say, "Of course, I'm against the yeah, babies being right. But yeah. now they're saying. I'm not. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. Like, or that didn't happen. Or it didn't happen. Yeah. But even if they admit it happened, it's like, yeah. Well, whatever. I'm not. I'm not mm-hmm. going to tell you. I'm yeah, against that. That's right. I want to talk. That's right. And they're not. They're not worried about how yeah. that looks any longer. Yeah. And you begin to get a little flavor of how these horrible things happened in the past. Yeah. We like we can't comprehend how did the Holocaust yeah. happen. No, that's and right. It's a cliche dehumanization. But now yeah. it's like, oh, that's actually what it looks like. Yeah. I, no, that's right. No, I have to say. I mean, I. I'm very patriotic. I love this country. My mother always told me that America is the promised land for the Jews more than Israel. Um, America is a philo-Semitic country. Jews are the most popular religious group in the country. If you look at the average, if you survey Americans, Jews are very well liked and respected. And so until a month or two ago, I thought, well, you know, of course it can't happen here. I mean, America is so different. America is you know, we don't. So I, I was very, very confident as a Jew in America that it could never happen here. And what has scared the hell out of me is the survey data showing that the great majority of Americans agree with agree with me on that if they're over thirty. But as you go down, the millennials and then especially Gen Z, 
they are evenly divided between Hamas and Israel, evenly divided. It's not to say that half of them support Hamas. I'm just saying, you know, many of them are in the middle. They don't know. But the number who support, and, and it was one of the surveys, it wasn't the Palestinians. It was Hamas. Who, you know, which side do you tend to take, more Hamas or Israel? And for Gen Z, it's actually even. So that scared the hell out of me, um, that it's just a matter of time before the consensus that has supported Jews and you know, Koreans and all kinds of immigrants in this country, that consensus um, might be going away. Uh, if we can't stop what's happening to Gen Z, if this is going to continue for, you know, for the next generation as well, we're in big trouble here. Yeah, they define everything as you know these, these shallow things, punching up and punching oh, down, black people yeah. can't. There was a real price yeah. to be paid for abandoning the very elegant and self-evident proposition that all men are created equal mm -hmm. and that you can't judge people by the color of their skin, the content yeah. of their that's character. Right. That's now considered this was, racist. This was yeah. really, this held us all together. Yeah, that's right. And now it, it morphed into you can't judge us by the color of their skin, mm -hmm. but we are, we're punching yeah. up so we can judge you by the yeah. color of their skin. And that was always dangerous for the Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, you know, we talked about yeah. it. Anyway. Um, all right. Anything? Okay. Any last? Well, I just wait. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Can, I, can I just say because I I started my list of four things and yeah. maybe some oh, people yeah, are yeah. thinking like yeah. you know, we got sidetracked on the first Please one. Please do. So flip phone. The way yeah. So the way to break the way to break these collective action traps is rule number one: nobody give a, a, a smartphone before high school. Just give a flip phone. Rule number two: no social media till sixteen. Mm -hmm. They can have most of the internet. But why do they need an account on Agreed. Instagram, TikTok? Now, what if it's just their friends who can can? It's to, but it, it just grows on from there. I mean, they can text each other. They can. There's all kinds of ways they can communicate without having something that gives you a feed that is algorithmically guided. Mm -hmm. Generally, okay. don't expose kids to an algorithmic feed run by AI until they're 16 at minimum. Uh, and again, 18 would be better. But I'm just saying, let's just have a norm of 16. That is really doable. Okay. So that's that's the second rule. I'm taking notes. Okay. Third rule is really simple: phone-free schools. Um, you know, the research is really clear. If a kid has a phone in in his pocket, he cannot not look at it. I if, can't either. But but it's it's much harder for them because if anyone is texting or posting, then they all have to. Otherwise. They're, they're out of the loop, and right. they'll be embarrassed at lunch when everyone's talking about the thing that everyone was talking about during math class. So phone-free schools is a must. Every school in the country needs to just say, come to school, put your phone in a phone, special phone locker or in a yonder pouch, which is not quite as effective, but still still pretty good. Um, that's the third rule, phone-free schools. That's that's a must. We have to do that is this that year. Is that not the case now? Are, people, no, are kids bringing their phones yeah. into class? Most 70% of schools say that they ban phones. What they mean is they have a rule. As my as my kids' schools, you can't take your phone out during class. So it's like you know but you it's have it in the pocket. It's in your pocket, right? So it's like you know in a drug treatment facility, you have you know you are not allowed to shoot up while you're here. Now you can keep your you know heroin your heroin in your, your pocket, pocket right. but you can't take it out. But cannot the teacher? I mean, if the kid takes out the phone and the kid is reprimanded, that's not that's not sufficient. But it's because they're not going to get reprimanded because the teachers are exhausted. They most of them give up. It's impossible. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. impossible. The teachers give up because yeah. they have enough to do. You'd need a full-time phone police person yeah. hanging out in the back three rows. So it, it just doesn't work. And then, like, you can't really check making them keep it in their locker either, right? Like, no, that's right. Back, yeah, back, keeping it in your backpack with a strict enforcement policy is better than nothing, but it's not, it's not nearly as good as a phone locker or a yonder mm. pouch. Um, so that's the third rule. And then the fourth rule is far more unsupervised play and childhood exploration. And in the book, I talk a lot about my collaboration with Lenore Skenazy. Uh, we co-founded an organization called Let Grow uh, with, with Peter Gray and Daniel Shookman. And we have some very simple solutions. Uh, one of them is called Play Club. It's so simple. Um, the school just says, because, okay, Peria, would you allow your, your daughter? Son. Your son, sorry, your son to stay at three o'clock on Fridays instead of coming home or going to some organized activity, he just hangs out with other kids on the playground and there's an adult not there yes. on the playground, but like just inside, like they can get. Yes. Exactly. So the school playground is the only place really that parents almost universally would trust their kids to be self-supervising. So what if every school, especially elementary schools and middle schools, say free play Friday, you know, we have play club on, fr on Friday. We have somebody who's close by and just, you know, you sign up. So it has the thing is, it has to be regular kids. Like, so they know, oh, yeah, I'm going to see these 12 yeah. kids. Yeah, 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 and it, sure. Boy, is that fun. When you have a group that meets up to play without adults, that's fun. So there's all kinds of things we can do. I With hope no screens exactly, is the thing. Exactly. It has to be no screens. That's right. Otherwise, they sit there on their screen. Yeah. 
And when schools go phone free, they all say the same thing. It's the most amazing thing. Kids in the hallway are laughing and talking. They're not silent. They're not silent and looking at their phones in between classes or at lunch. So I'm going to actually take you up on the flip phone thing. I have a group of our entire fourth grade. None of the kids mm -hmm. have phones yet. And there's been there are some pretty like big like tech people who are mm -hmm. parents. And there's been this big push of like, let's make a deal for nobody to get phones until they're 16. Mm -hmm. And I am going to bring this and I will report um, back to you. Okay. Uh, Wait until 16 is going to be too much to ask in, in this. In, uh, that's why I'm saying just high school. No, I said high school. I think high school is the clear dividing line. Now, that's great. If they want to go till 16, that's great. But I think to make a commitment to high school is at least more doable. But no, fine. I shouldn't say But, but no, fine, no, 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 but you said try. no phones, flip phones only for anybody below 16, right? No, I didn't say that. Oh. I said no She's smartphone impossible. no smartphone before high school. No smartphone. Yeah. Before. No, I think parents would be wise to go to 16. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the rule that we can all commit to is, is just nothing before high school. So anyway, so those four, if, those four rules, those are just norms that if most people follow them, even if half the people follow them, it's going to be so much easier for the rest of us who want to delay now, entry. Now, I've been doing something. She and I had a fight about it, and then she cheated. But uh, we, we t we've taken vacations. Our families together. We go to mm -hmm. Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, my rule and every – now, this is speaking from privilege because we're fortunate enough to be able to take vacations, right? But um, whenever I take a vacation, I do not allow the kids to bring any screens. Mm -hmm. And so we have, like, two weeks in Maine – there are no. They can watch TV at night, like yeah, you say, because TV yeah. is social. Yeah, that's right. But they're not allowed to spend time on their screen. That's great. And what do they do? Do they like the policy or hate it? They they squirm for a day and then yeah. they get used to it. Right. Yeah. And and do you do you see them doing things that they wouldn't do if they had their screens? Like, do they Just become more, more inventive? Yeah. Just more present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And I I I will make one recommendation. I bought all my kids uh, Amazon Kindles mm -hmm. to read on. Yeah, I think that's okay because that's not that's really yeah, just a fine. book. I think. Yeah. And that solved a lot mm. because they, they don't have the excuse of wanting to do it. Kindle is a great thing for kids yeah. because if they're interested and you touch the word, it gives you the mm -hmm. meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. And I know that I depend on that tremendous. Mm -hmm. My vocabulary has really improved since I got a Kindle. And I like the fact that my kids have that. And they can carry yeah. basically I, unlimited I'll, books at one yeah. time. That's a great idea. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start recommending them. And you I can't like do anything on a Kindle but read. Right. That's All right, right. maybe I should get him a Kindle. Yeah. So I... I, I mean, but no one brought up the point that, that some screens are good. You're reading books. What about YouTube mm -hmm. videos that are uh, in, uh, educational? Yeah. Things well, like that. Right, but so what we have to focus on is not, not screens necessarily, not just screens. It's when are we exposing kids to things that are... Um, um, re punish, uh, rewarding or punishing, using algorithms, training them with rapid fire stuff. So YouTube, a lot of good stuff on YouTube, um, but but kids can go down rabbit holes there. Yes. But YouTube videos are longer than TikTok videos. TikTok is the worst because Not TikTok YouTube shorts though. It's well, YouTube. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So it's the short. It's the short mm -hmm. duration. That's what fragments attention. That's what allows for the behaviors conditioning. So keep your kids the hell away from any sort of short form video. YouTube shorts are even, I've understood very recently, even more dangerous than TikTok. Oh, why is that? I, don't, I haven't seen them. Um, apparently, I just learned this the other day, because they're uploaded so quickly, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for YouTube to take them down, oh, and they're intentionally tagged with um, like inappropriate material oh, mm -hmm. for children. Mm. And there is this aspect, too, that you have to know your own child, right? Like, mm -hmm. like it, it, And because I, I do see... Differences between my kids. By the way, I'm not particularly worried about video games. Like my my young kid mm -hmm. plays Fortnite a lot. Okay, and we I'm, should... I'm not that worried about it. I'm well, you, so right, video games is a little bit different. Most almost all kids, almost all boys play video games. Um, they love them. Um, they think that they generally uh, have positive things to say about them. Whereas girls on social media are very negative. They don't think social media is very good. The problem with video games, um, the main there's two main problems. One is just the opportunity cost. So because these games are so amazing, they're not like the games you and I played when we were kids, like Pong or, you know, whatever. Donkey I mean, Kong. Donkey Kong, yeah, or Pac-Man. Like, these are incredible immersive games. So they, they suck boys in. And if your son is spending three or four hours a day on these games, which many do, that means they're not doing a lot of anything else. That's basically their childhood is video games. The other problem is that somewhere between about 5 and 10%, depending on how strict you want to be on the criteria, are addicted, or at least it's called problematic use. It's called internet gaming disorder in one classification. And 
this means that the, they're on it so much, it's, it's changing their dopamine neurons because they're constantly rewarded, and when you trigger dopamine often over time, the brain down-regulates those receptors to balance it out. So once your brain is adapted to the constant high level of dopamine, now when you're not playing video games, you have too little dopamine, and everything is boring and unpleasant, and you're irritable, and you have conflicts with your family. Is that family. the same for porn? Uh, well, porn, I mean, I don't know. They don't... No, is it you, don't, like when, you, when you're when oh, yeah. a real person compared to the... Yeah, except that I think... I don't know. I don't, I don't think boys are on porn four hours a day, but they are on video games four hours a day. But yes, porn does the same thing. That's right. Yeah, it yeah. desensitizes you to having sex with a real person. That's yeah. been well documented. That's right. Isn't it? You get, that's right. Man, uh, so so with, with porn, the research is much trickier because you can't really do porn research on 14-year-old boys. So it's only with young men that they do it. By the way, you've dropped on us a lot of... Uh, uh, stuff about <laughs> a serious gender differences. Girls don't play video games. Um, He's fearless. Girls fearless. don't watch porn. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yeah, he did. I he think said well, girls they, don't watch well, porn. Are you they getting any blowback they, from saying these things? You mean that there are gender differences? That there are differences, and profound yeah. ones, according yeah. to, to what you... I mean, yeah. I never even I thought about girls in video games, but I guess they mm-hmm. don't play video yeah. games. Well, they, no, they do play them, but not nearly as much. Not nearly... They're almost, they're almost never addicted. It's five-to-one ratio of addicts. It's five-to-one boys. Well, now, what's, what's going on there? Same thing with there? porn. What's going on? Uh, the porn, we understand mm-hmm. why that would be, yeah. I think. But mm-hmm. what's, what's, why aren't girls into video games? So, uh, so one thing I say in the book, and this actually I did think about whether, I, you know, I had to, whether I'm going to be attacked for saying it. There are differences in the basic social needs of boys and girls and men and women, and it boils down to um, we all have needs for communion and for agency, but girls have stronger needs for communion, connecting, being part of a group, belonging, and boys have stronger needs for agency, meaning making things happen, you know, building something and then blowing it up. Um, you know, fighting, uh, you know, be, being effective as uh, fighting a team, you know, so boy, team sports. Um, so because of those differences, the social, the, the companies, the tech companies know, ooh, if we want to get girls, let's talk about them, you know, being connected and this will connect you. And they take over girls' social lives about connection. Boys want to do rough and tumble play, but the world is saying, no, you can't. Oh, Fortnite, it's all rough and tumble play, virtual. Now, you don't actually get scared. You know, I watch my son jump out of a plane, you know, every, you know, 12, eight minutes. I don't know how long a game takes. You know, they jump out of a plane, they surf on bombs, they throw, you know, but it's fun. But it's not like, I mean, when you look at what happens in the military, I'm just saying the way that men get bonded together from facing real danger is extraordinary. And the way that boys get bonded together because they've, you know, played Fortnite a thousand times, I believe is trivial. Now, I'm sure I'll get attacked for that because there are many boys (laughs) who say that, their best relationship from Fortnite, and they're probably right because they don't have the option of of real life packs. Yeah, he probably plays too much, but um, he's having fun. He's he's getting good hand eye con mm-hmm. hand eye coordination for sure. You should hit that guitar uh, a little hard. He talks to people. I'm mean, I'm yeah. in the room with him always, yeah. so I see what's going okay. on. Okay, but so, how how many hours a day, and is it seven days a week? It 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 could be seven days a week, but on school days it's not that much. On the weekend sometimes it goes when on, you were okay. especially in the winter time. It when mm-hmm. it, when the weather is warmer, we we're outside. outside more. Yeah. Who does he okay. talk to? Uh, the other well, they, kids. On you know, were you that way with the guitar when you were little? The way he is with Fortnite. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit, but not, no. For, the, See, very I, don't, different I don't let him do anything online that lets him talk Let's, to other people. All right, we, we could talk later. We have yeah. to go. Anyway, okay. all right. All right, thank you, um, Jonathan Height, The yeah. Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic. A mental illness. I thought it was already out. It's not out no, until it's March, March 26. 24. That's right. March 26. March 26. And can you pre-order it now on Amazon? Yes. Please do pre-order it on pre-order Amazon. Pre-order it on Amazon.com. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank My you. My pleasure, everyone. Great Thank talk. you, John. Thank you. That was so nice interesting.